Hello class, this will be lecture 1b, so the second lecture for week 1 over the history and the development of the horse. For those of you that did decide to purchase the book, um, or are have purchased the book and haven't received it yet, this is going to correspond with chapter 1. Um, because we only have one lecture for this topic, we won't cover the entire chapter, it'll just be a portion of Chapter 1, History and Development of the Horse, that goes along with the Equine Science 5th edition by Rick Parker. Going throughout this lecture, I will tell you that this does not follow my norm normal teaching style. Um, history and development of the horse is important to understand. Um, it's important to set us up for moving into topics within the equine industry and the horse themselves, but there's not a lot of hands-on application um, a lot of it is just facts and information and speculation, um, myth, and analysis of, of data of what we do have. So that being said, um, we'll get into more interesting content, more fun lectures as we go. So we'll try to keep this one kind of short and sweet to get through the content of history and development of the horse. So the first thing that I want to start off with is evolution. So evolution of the horse. It's not something that occurred in a straight line toward a goal um, like the steps of a ladder, but rather it was a branching um, with no predetermined ending. Many horse-like animals branched off of the evolutionary tree and evolved along various unrelated routes with differing number of toes and adaptations to different diets. Um, now there is only one genus that is the surviving branch of a once mighty and sprawling evolutionary bush. Of the several species within that genus, um, today's true horse it has the following um, zoological scheme that we will go through. So the zoological scheme of the horse for evolution, um, the kingdom that they belong to is Animalia, so they're an animal. The phylum is Chordata. The class is Mammalia. The order is Perstodactyl. The family is Equidae. And then the genius is Equus. Um, so the current horse, um, the genus that is remaining, is the equus. That is what we know as the current and common horse um, that all of us are familiar with. It's important to make note before we get much further in looking at the equine species, what exactly is the study of the horse? So the study of the horse, um, the Greek word for horse is hippos, so oftentimes we refer to the study of the horse as hippology. Um, hippology is the study of the horse and the term is frequently used to describe contests in which individuals or teams exhibit their knowledge and understanding of equine science and husbandry. Um, participants will often demonstrate their experience and knowledge gained in horse judging, quiz bowl speeches, and practical horse management um, throughout the duration of this competition. So getting a little bit further into evolution and the study of the horse, we look at the geological time scale as well as the fossil records. So during the Eohippus, this is going to be the earliest ancestor of the present horse. Um, this was a small primitive horse that was about the size of a fox. It had a elongated skull, a moderately arched back, as well as a shortened tail from what we're familiar with today. There were four different functional toes on each front foot, but only three toes on each hind limb. So instead of having one solid hoof or one single toe, um, the Eohippus had four functional toes on the front feet and three functional toes on the hind feet. The structure of its teeth suggested that it was a browser, and the earliest remains of this extinct animal were found in the rocks um, about 54 million years ago in North America. However, the most recent fossils have been found in rocks of about 50 million years old in Europe. 
So this is going to be the Eohippus, which is the earliest ancestor of the present um, horse. Then we have the Mesohippus. Um, this was about 35 million years ago when Earth's temperature and climate was changing. The forest thinned and grasses became more prevalent. This animal, the Mesohippus, was larger than the Eohippus. So like we said, the Eohippus was about the size of a fox, whereas the Mesohippus <coughs> was larger. Its teeth, teeth had further evolved as it only had three toes in its front feet and was better suited to outrun its enemies. So the Eohippus had those um, four toes on the front feet, three toes on the hind feet. So when we move from the Eohippus to the Mesohippus, the Mesohippus had evolved to only have three toes on the four feet as well as the hind feet. And this made them better suited to outrun their enemies. Um, as the swamp gave away to soft ground, these toes became less essential. On Mesohippus, the lateral supporting toes decreased in size while the middle toe was strengthened. The toes now ended in little hooves that still had a pad behind them. In both Europe and North America, these browsing horses became extinct about 7 million years ago. So moving from the Mesohippus, we move to the Marichippus. Um, this was about 20 million years ago when this new type of horse appeared. The Marichippus evolved in North America and adapted to the grasses of the plains. This was the beginning of the grazing horse of today, and its height was about 35 inches. So 35 inches, this is still fairly um, fairly small, so this is more so what we would think of um, ranging in our miniature horses. So the Marichippus Hippus is about 35 inches, and when we look at our miniatures, the standard cutoff for a miniature horse is 38 inches. So for those of y'all that are familiar with Romeo at the farm or saw him when, our, when we did our facilities, for, facilities tour, the Marija Hippus is going to be about the size of a miniature. Um, it was increasingly gregarious and lived in herds. Um, and to chew these rough grasses, they developed complicated grinding teeth similar to those of the present-day horse. Its lateral toes shrank and no longer reached the ground, and the main toe thickened and hardened for swift travel on dry ground. The feet had no pads, and the weight was carried on an elongated single hoof on the central toe. And then we move into the Philohippus. At the beginning of the Philohippus, this was about 5 million years ago, one branch of the horse ancestor crossed into Asia. This quickly um, multiplied and spread to Europe, while meanwhile in North America, the horse developed into its final form. Um, the Philohippus was the first true one-toed animal of evolutionary history. It was needed, um, this animal needed speed to outrun its enemies, so the hoof evolved from the continued overdevelopment of the middle toe. Its teeth and limbs were the nearest to our present day horse, and this horse now spread into South America, Asia, Europe, and Africa. So when we look at exactly how evolution works, um, we know that it's not linear, but it's branching. So common evolutionary trends are not seen in all of the horse lines, like we discussed when we first started this lecture. Um, rates of evolution are largely going to depend on the ecological pressures faced um, by that individual species. Evolving along with the modern horse were other species of equus, such as the asses or donkeys and various zebras. However, tracing a line of descent from the Eohippus to the equus Fossils reveal four different trends. These four different trends that we can pinpoint throughout evolution include the reduction in the number of toes. So we talked about when we started at the Eohippus that we started with four toes on the forelimb and three toes on the hind limb. Our modern day horse, we have a single hoof. Um, so they're a single toed animal. So we can, that first trend is reduction in the number of toes. There is an increase in the size of the cheek teeth, so that increase in the size of the cheek teeth is largely due um, to, the, to the type of feed um, grasses that are available to our horses and how they're required to forage to survive. 
Um, there was also lengthening of the face as well as an increase in body size. So we talked about the Eohippus, how they were approximately the size of a fox. Um, then we get up into the Merchiohippus, and we have, they're about 35 inches, so about the size of a miniature horse. And then we have our horses today um, that are going to be 15, 16, 17 hand horses. So when we look at a, a hand, we measure our horses in hands, not inches, once we move away from miniatures. And when we're measuring our horses in hands, four inches is going to be one hand. So you can do the math there to figure out, you know, how many inches is 14, 15, 16 hands per se. So now we're ready to move on from evolution into domestication of the horse. Domestication of the horse for perhaps half a million years, um, humankind's only contact with the horse was as a hunter in search of food, which is rather unique when we look at the equine species now. Um, equine are kind of teetering on that line of being a livestock species and being a pet. So not something that, especially in the U.S., that we would consider today um, using our horses as a source of food, but ultimately in early years of um, domestication and contact, that's what our horses were being used for. Between 4000 and 3000 BC, humans began to domesticate horses. Um, oxen were already being yoked and driven, as well as other species had similarly been harnessed prior. While some of the history of the domesticated horse is rather obscured, our knowledge of the donkey is more certain. Artifacts suggest that donkeys were first domesticated in Egypt as early as 3400 BC and by 1000 BC had spread from Egypt into Asia. When we look at our equine um, in early domestication, they went from a cow of the plains to a pack animal very, very quickly. Archaeological evidence shows that the horse became progressively important in the economy of the people of the plains of Europe and Asia. Although they were still considered a source of food, tame horses were first kept for meat as well as milk. I don't know if any of you all have any experiences um, with reproduction, breeding, foaling out mares, and if you've ever milked a mare, but I know that it, it can be rather um, time-consuming, and I can only imagine milking a mare out um, for that to be your primary consumption of milk and nutrients. It would, it would take you quite a while to do so, but regardless... Um, early on in domestication, these horses were considered a source of food as they were being kept for their meat and milk production. Later, as these domesticated animals began to carry the goods of the nomadic tribes, their importance grew very quickly as the horse was now a worker, not just a meal on hoof. The role of the wheel played a large role in domestication. As as vehicles with disc wheels appeared near the beginning of the 3rd millennial BC, they were drawn by oxen, donkeys, and other species. It was probably important for the steppes of southern Asia as the horse first appeared as a domesticated draft animal in the Near East between 3000 and 2000 BC. This was largely because of the horse's speed. It soon became the favorite draft animal. By the time horses were numerous in the region, a light chariot with spoke wheels had been developed for war and hunting. Yoked to it, the horse rapidly gained favor over its other relatives in a harness for these purposes. When we look at learning to control and harness horses, their anatomy makes them rather unique compared to um, other animals that were previously used for harness and yoke. The ability to control the horse and effectively connect it to useful implements depended on developing appropriate draft systems that would allow the horse to work at its best. Um, previously, the first draft systems were developed for oxen and were not well adapted to that equine anatomy. At first, horses were harnessed in pairs with each horse on either side of a pole and under a yoke. However, the yoke was secured by a strap around the throat that tended to press on the horse's windpipe. By the end of the 15th century BC in Egypt, the yoke saddle would have been introduced. This was a wishbone-shaped wooden object 
bit lashed to the yoke by its handle with its legs lying along the horse's shoulders. This design took considerable pressure off the horse's throat and allowed it to breathe more easily. The yoke saddles rested on pads and their ends were joined by a crescent-shaped strap that went across the lower part of the horse's throat. In addition, when we look at um, learning to control and harness horses, we also have the development of early bits. So early bits in design is largely going to be made of natural materials, um, bone and different things that the land had available. Um, as we further develop bits and control, there were two types of snaffle, bit, snaffle bits that appeared almost simultaneously the plain bar snaffle and the jointed um, bit. Both bits were usually had studs on the inner surfaces of the cheek pieces to enforce directional control when one rein was pulled. Um, for those of you that are more advanced and you've seen a different variety of different types of bits, um, so the bit is going to fit into the horse's mouth and aid in control, you know that we've significantly increased technology from these two styles of bits, that we have our curb bits and our snaffle bits. There's many, many designs that go um, amongst those two categories of bits. So moving on from learning to control and harnessing our horses, we then still had to learn how to ride. Learning to drive horses came before learning to ride them in the Near East. Large chariot forces required schooled, disciplined, and highly conditioned horses. Riding was still pursued only in a casual fashion, as disciplined military mounts trained to function with their riders in formation were used only after 1000 BC. Horseback riders before this time period were decepted as unarmed riders and probably grooms or messengers. At first, riders may have controlled their mounts with no more than a rope around the jaw or some sort of hackmore. Antler cheek pieces, which served as toggles to soften mouthpieces of rope, rawhide, may have been found at sites of the earliest domesticated horse on the um, north, just north of the Black Sea. So, moving on from learning to ride the horse, we can go through um, we can go through all different historical regions. We can look at the Roman army. We can look at China. We can look at Europe after the Romans. We can look at the Renaissance. But my main interest is going to be in the history of the horse in the U.S. So we'll go ahead and roll into that section. So looking specifically at history of horses and mules within the United States. Beginning with the colonization and settlement. With colonization, signs of the growing importance of the horse could be seen in the towns and cities by the increased number of hitching posts, mounting blocks, water troughs, stables, as well as carriage houses, only to mention a few. By the late 1800s, the horse was central to urban life in America. It hauled goods, pulled cabs, and moved people about in carriages. The prosperity of the urban population created a huge new market for horses. In turn, carriage makers, wheelwrights, harness makers, and feed merchants were prospering because of the horse's increased predominance in everyday life. The exploration and settlement of new frontier land in America also created an enormous need for the horse. As settlers saw the horse as a means of expansion and as power for taming the wilderness and cultivating the virgin soil. The sluggish but easily maintained ox had previously fulfilled the farmer's needs. However, the versatility of the horse made it an even more valuable asset to the farmer during the 1800s. Horses plowed fields, pulled wagons and carriages, and became an essential part of the rural economy. The horse population grew very rapidly during the 1800s. For example, in 1867, the rural horse population in America was estimated at nearly 8 million, while the number of farm workers was well under 7 million. When we consider the colonization and settlement, there was um, 
a number of comparisons and differences between the horse and the mule. The changes in farm machinery also increased the demand for mules. Beginning in the 1830s, farm machinery such as moving, reaping, and threshing machines, John Deere steel plow, the corn planter, and the two-horse cultivator were invented. Keep in mind all of these um, vehicles of technology and agriculture as you look at your supplemental assignment. This would be one of the three that you can select to use. So keep in mind when we're looking at mowing and reaping and threshing machines, um, steel plows, the corn planter, and the two-horse cultivator were invented um, during this 1830s time period. So keep in mind those when we're comparing them to current farm machinery. But the inventions called for the heavier and stronger horse or mule. Mules were especially valued in the coal mines where the poor working, division, working conditions were defeating to many horses. Typical coal mules could haul between 60 and 100 tons of coal a day in two to five cars from mines. Mules were also had a long career in the United States Army. The government used them from 1775 until 1957 to transport supplies and packs and under harnesses. Moving on from the colonization and settlement, there was a number of commercial uses in which the horses increased in popularity in the United States. The draft horse played a significant role as the towns grew in size and commercial uses of horses increased. As cities grew, so did the demand for powerful horses. Heavy horses hauled cargo, unloaded at city terminals by railroads, steamships, and canal boats, and they distributed the goods produced in urban factories. Some businesses used brightly painted delivery wagons pulled by handsomely matched teams to advertise their products as they transported product. Breweries, meat, meat packers, and dairies were particularly fond of this practice as they assembled elaborate wagons powered by four to six harnessed draft horses. By 1890, draft horses averaged 2,000 pounds apiece in size. So these large animals were largely bred and developed um, because of the increased need for means of transportation and commercial uses of the horse. These hitches shoot soon began to compete in the show ring, especially at the annual International Livestock Show previously held at the Chicago Stockyards. Their legacy is carried on today in the famous Budweiser Clydesdales and other show hitches performing in the American show rings. Moving from commercial uses of horses, we also use them for fire protection um, in the early years in the United States. The horse became an essential part of urban fire protection during the 1850s. As cities grew, the magnitude of destruction from urban fires was increasing in turn. With the introduction of heavier and more efficient steam pumpers and ladder trucks in the 1850s, horses were required for urban fire departments, as speed was essential. Fire horses were almost always draft horses, crosses that were selected for their speed as well as their strength. By 1906, New York City had 1,500 fire horses. Aside from fire protection, we also bring into context transportation. As the horse was essential for transportation, when roads became warm between towns and farms, a lighter wagon was needed. Um, Transportation could be small-scale, large-scale, private, um, or commercial uses. So transportation was very common to use horses during this time period as it was prior to um, the fueled engine. As for agriculture, throughout the 18th and early 19th century, horses in the United States were used primarily for riding and pulling light vehicles. Oxen were the preferred draft animal in many American farms, as they cost half as much as a horse, required half the feed, and then could be eaten when they died or were no longer useful. Oxen, however, worked only half as fast as the horse, 
as their hooves left them virtually useless on frozen winter fields and roads, and physiologically they were unsuitable for pulling the new farm equipment developed in the 19th century. As a result, the revolution in agricultural technology, westward expansion, and the growth of the American cities during the 1800s led to the emergence of the draft horse as America's principal farming work animal. In 1862, Congress passed the Morrill Land Grant Act. This led to the establishment of the state agricultural colleges. So these are all of our land grant colleges. Typically, there's one in each state. Some states will have two. For Kentucky, our land grant college is the University of Kentucky. The first of the nation's veterinarian colleges also opened um, at Cornell University in 1868. As a result of these two items, the farmers became more educated and improvements in the care, feeding, and breeding of horses quickly followed. The first European draft horses were imported to the United States in the late 1830s. From farm labor became scarce due to westward migration and casualties from the Civil War. This created an even greater demand for the new farm equipment and the draft horses to power them. As for um, sticking with the history of horses and mules in the United States, but we're going to shift gears a little bit um, from application of requirements of the animals supporting our way of life and switch gears and go to, into re recreation, sport, and shows. So previously in history, our horses were used for work primarily. There was a level of sports and recreation, but our primary purpose of our horses was for work. When we look at the current standing of the horses, we're primarily using them for recreation, sports, and shows. So a little bit of shift as technological advancements have occurred um, in history has, has changed and, and what we're doing with our horses. So when we look at recreation, sports, and shows, we're going to start off with rodeo. This once informal sport of cowboys developed into an organized event. Rodeo is a Spanish word for cattle ring. It started as an amusement among cowboys who had reached the end of the long cattle drive and had to remain with their herds until they were sold. Given a few days of freedom, it was not long before one cow hand challenged another to a calf roping contest or dared him to ride the meanest horse between here and the Rio Grande. The first rodeo was with paid attendance was held in Prescott, Arizona on July 4th of 1886. So 1886 was the first um, rodeo with paid attendance. Today, major events in a rodeo often include bareback bronc riding, saddle bronc riding, tie-down roping, bull riding, team roping, and then the cowgirls barrel racing. Sometimes we'll throw in um, breakaway roping as well. Um, as for racing, Kentucky has long been recognized as a horse breeding region. But back when Kentucky was only a remote and unknown woodland, the chief horse breeding region of the United States was Rhode Island. From these Rhode Island farms, horses were shipped to all of the coastal colonies as well as the Caribbean islands for use on the plantations. Rhode Island was the only New England colony that allowed horse racing. So Rhode Island was the only New England colony that allowed horse racing and a one mile track was maintained at Sandy Neck Beach, South Kingston. As always, um, competition is the key to improving breeding. Rhode Island breeders gathered the best stock from neighboring areas to upgrade their horses. When we look at the development of racing and how that transitioned over time, the first Kentucky Derby was run on May 17th of 1875. The Derby was sponsored by the Louisville Jockey Club and Driving Association, which owned the track now known as Churchill Downs. The 
The Kentucky Derby um, race was called a derby after the Epson Derby, which was the first run in 1780 under the sponsorship of the Earl of Derby. Today, the Kentucky Derby is the most prestigious race for thoroughbreds in the United States and the first race in the Triple Crown for three-year-olds. Each year in May, horse enthusiasts look to Churchill Downs in Louisville to see who will become this year's contender for the Triple Crown. The Kentucky Derby is the oldest continuously run race in America. So now that we've completed that short lecture over the history and the development of the horse, um, you will now be able to complete your week 1B assignment, and I've also posted your supplemental assignment for this week. I will leave these open a little bit longer as I did want to make sure on Wednesday when we all met for lab, I wanted to make sure that you all had reviewed your syllabus and your schedule and were adequately prepared. So this lecture is posted um, a little behind time and I will make sure that over the weekend I will post your week two assignments and that way you'll have adequate time to get those completed in the future. So make sure to finish out this week that you're completing your week 1B assignment and you're also completing that supplemental assignment one.